and welcome to Ask Deb About Business. I am Ron Gaiozu, co-host. We are broadcasting via Futures Television, the home of the future on television. You can watch us via Roku TV or Apple TV. If you're listening to the show via podcast or watching us on TV, you too can be part of the conversation. Just visit our YouTube channel, and that is IMCI Magazine, where we continue to chat about the topic of the day. You can also access this information on our website, and that is www.futurestelevision.com. So don't be shy. Today, our topic is protect your content, safeguarding your intellectual property. So how do you protect your property? Well, uh, the answer to that is simple. Alarms, metal gates, camera systems. Uh, perhaps if you own a bar or a high volume restaurant, you might also hire security guards and station them at strategic locations throughout your establishment. Well, that's fair enough. But perhaps the better question is, what is the property that you should be seeking to protect? One could certainly have made an argument all the way back to the Berne Convention in 1886 that intellectual property is a valuable commodity. Over the past few years, Thousands of physical storefronts have struggled to keep their doors open. And as more businesses navigate the impacts of the coronavirus, many of the challenges brands have been facing are only exacerbated. As a result, we cannot ignore that your most valuable property might well be far more nebulous, amorphous, and intangible than the often cited in quite literal brick and mortar. So what exactly is an intellectual property? Well, intellectual property, according to Merriam-Webster, is property, such as an idea, an invention, or a process that derives from the work of the mind or intellect. So is every idea, no matter how unoriginal, or every invention, no matter how useless, and every creation, no matter how mundane, intellectual property? As we will see during our discussion today, it is not that simple. It is best to recognize that our founding fathers deemed innovation so vital to the success and stability of our new country that they embedded the roots of intellectual property rights in the U.S. Constitution under the commonly referred to patent and copyright clause. It reads, in part, that Congress has the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. Now that we know a bit more about what intellectual property really is, let's return to our original question. How we protect it. There's really a lot of a lot to talk about on this topic, but but worry no more. Now we have someone to talk to. But first, let me say a few words about the show. Broadcasting live from Butterfield Studio in Chicago land to the world, I'd like to welcome you to Ask Deb about business. The talk show is broadcast every other Thursday at 11 a.m. Central Time, where I join Deb Dietz to discuss a variety of business topics. No matter what your venture is, you will certainly have questions. Worry no more. Now you have someone to talk to. So let me say a few words about Deb Dietz before we get started. Deb has a long and distinguished career as a coach, mentor, and through her awesome training programs at SMB Digital Education, she has enabled many entrepreneurs to follow their dreams. And that's exactly what I like about her. Her ability to deliver practical advice to help you solve real problems. So if you have a business question, well, let's ask Deb. <laughs> well, without further ado, let's welcome Deb Dietz. 
to the show. Hi, Deb. How are you? Hi, Ram. Good to see you. How you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, wonderful to see you in the beautiful Butterfield Studio in Vernon Hills, Illinois. Absolutely. Happy to be here. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome. The Ask Deb About Business show focuses on emerging trends, key issues, challenges, and opportunities facing small to mid-market businesses, business owners, business leadership, business professionals. And we invite subject matter experts to come on our show and explore those issues and opportunities in greater detail. And my promise to you that by the end of our time together today, that you will walk away with at least one key takeaway that you can implement within your own business. And I'm delighted that our special guest today is Kelly Keller. And Kelly is an intellectual property attorney, and she's going to share with us her expertise. Specifically, we're gonna talk about the castle analogy and how you can protect not only your intellectual property, but also protect your business. How wonderful. So let's say a few words about Kelly before we get started. All righty. So Kelly Keller is a 25-year veteran of the intellectual property field, during which she has helped global brands and small businesses protect their brands, creativity, and innovation, and has seen it all, from the biggest mistakes to the biggest victories. Kelly works with companies in various stages of development and their in-house legal departments by helping them build stronger legal and business partnerships that facilitate the transformation of both tacit and codified knowledge, creativity, and innovation into high value strategic assets that when leveraged properly, increase value and drive competitive edge. Kelly's personal law practice also includes representing clients on a broad range of domestic and international intellectual property issues with an emphasis on trademark and copyright matters licensing and enforcement of intellectual property rights and providing counsel and advice on brand expansion and management, domain name disputes, copyright protection, and new media law. She works closely with patent attorneys skilled in various arts to assist clients in determining the best protection strategies for their inventions. Kelly has represented clients across a broad range of industries, including software, fintech, electronics, supermarkets, manufacturing, pharmaceuticals, telecommunications, and entertainment. She counsels clients on use and registration of trademarks in the United States and abroad, including best practices for the selection, adoption, maintenance, and enforcement of trademarks service marks, and other forms of trade identity, such as trade dress, product design, product configuration, and right of publicity. Having a strong background in copyright matters, she also advises clients regarding registration, licensing, enforcement, and rights clearance. This often includes providing counsel regarding the Digital Millennium Copyright Act DMCA, compliance, content protection, licensing, and enforcement. Her copyright experience encompasses a broad spectrum of works of authorship, including some source code, databases, websites, online works, photographs, musical works, painting, drawings, fabric designs, sculptures, toys, product labels, books, and architectural drawings. Kelly frequently negotiates the settlement of pre-litigation disputes and those opposition proceedings before the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board of the U.S. Patent Trademark Office and litigates various intellectual property disputes in the federal courts. Well, uh, without further ado, let's welcome Kelly to the show. Hi there, Kelly. Hi, Rom. Hi, Kelly. 
Good to see you. Good, Good to, to see, see you. you too. Thanks for having me on the show. Absolutely. You know, Ram and I are delighted to have you. And this is such an important topic um, because on our show, we often talk a lot about um, performance management of businesses and how businesses can capitalize on opportunities for growth. Today, we're going to focus on opportunities to reduce risk. And so I'm so happy that, that you're with us to share your wisdom about how businesses can certainly um, help to ensure that their, their intellectual property, their assets are protected, but ultimately how their business, how they can protect their businesses most effectively. And so when we were chatting and preparing for today's show, you spoke to me uh, and shared with me the, the, um, the castle analogy. Mm -hmm. And I really loved this, and I'm so happy that we're having this conversation today because this is a way of looking at your business, you know, holistically, enterprise-wide, mm -hmm. and protecting all your assets. And so, you know, let's just start off by having you share with us the castle analogy and what, and how did you get to develop this? What was some of the thinking behind it? Sure, sure. So let's think about um, the castle and what it's there for and why we have the castle. And I will tell you that I was inspired by this um, when Warren Buffett is famously um, credited with saying, I like to invest in economic castles with unbreachable moats. And when I read that, I thought, you know, this makes a lot of sense. And I think that we can take this concept as a great analogy and really flesh it out so that it breaks it down to kind of step by step, bit by bit, and what can we do as we're actually building a business. So he basically says the castle is the business and the moat is the competitive advantage. So the deeper and the wider the moat, the harder it is for competitors to come in close to your business replicate what you're doing and compete with you in the marketplace. So as a matter of strategy, we want to make sure that we have a very, very strong castle on an impenetrable foundation. And we want that deep and wide moat. It's not just enough to have a strong castle, but if people can come up and knock on the door and come right in, then kind of defeats the point of putting all the effort into the castle if we're not going to protect its perimeter. So that's the inspiration. So let's think about the castle in this sense. In medieval times, people would build castles to protect kingdoms. And the castle keep was the center part of the castle where the family lived and where all of the crown jewels, the treasure jewels, all of the things that were valuable were housed. And the whole castle was built around the keep so that you would have, you know, you would have the four towers and you would have the connecting walls and you would have all these different elements that were there to make it harder for people to come in to quote, capture the king and get the crown jewels. So that's the analogy. And I liken that to say, hey, listen, if we look at our castle as a business, and the thing that makes us unique in the marketplace, what is it that we offer? What's our value proposition? What are we selling or what transformation are we providing that is unique and different from anybody else? And everything that goes into that, that's in your castle keep and you want to protect that from competitors, legitimate and illegitimate at all cost. And that will give you an opportunity, not just to continue to offer your products and services, but to protect the base of them so that you can continue to grow and you can uh, become more sophisticated in your products, your services and offerings, and ultimately build from a small business into an enterprise organization. You know, I, I love that. And I think, you know, if let's let's take it a step deeper here and let's let's kind of break it down. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, you mentioned the, you know, the, t the, t the towers, the walls, um, the moat of the castle. Um, let's break it down and look specifically at, at the towers and what they signify. And so I think in our conversation, we talked about, you know, the first tower, tower number one, is protecting yourself, right? 
you know, as a business owner, you need to protect your own personal assets, right? Um, so, you know, you need to protect yourself, your family, uh, you know, so that you can avoid financial disaster is just one example. So um, tell us a little bit about the thinking behind Tower One, protecting yourself personally so that you can limit the liability that you have with your business. Certainly. So when we think about protecting ourselves, when we go into business, what we want to do is make sure that the business is something unique and separate and that it has its own legal identity. So that way, any of the debts or liabilities that it takes on can only be satisfied by the business and not from you personally. So when we start our businesses as sole proprietors, we tend to be uh, you know, it's just us, it's not a big deal. And we don't really separate ourselves from the business activity. So the first thing that we should do is create a business entity. And usually those come in the form of a limited liability company or a corporation. And what that does is it puts a legal wall around the business that's separate from you. Therefore, the business is the one offering products or services, not you as an individual. So let's say things go south and the business is going, you know, the business is going under or it's having a difficult time paying its bills, then any creditors who want to come after the business can only seek to satisfy its debts and its obligations from assets of the business, not from your personal assets, which may include, you know, a home. It may include, you know, vehicles. It may include investment properties. There's lots of assets that could be liquidated into cash to settle debts of the business that would be holding you personally liable. But if you build that wall of protection around you, or sometimes they call it the um, sort of the bubble, and you put the business in the bubble, then you are protected from having to be personally responsible for any of those obligations. So that's really critically important is looking at the structure of your business, making sure that you're incorporating um, correctly, right? So it, so making sure you're doing your due diligence there to make sure you have the right business entity um, that you're establishing for yourself uh, that will serve you well in the future. Um, let's talk about you know, tower number two, which is really focused on, you know, intellectual property itself. You know, you and I know each other, you know, we work together. Um, if for someone personally who develops content, you know, online education is an example, critically important to protect that asset because that is a key part of our, you know, revenue generation, a revenue generating business strategy. So let's talk specifically about some of the recommendations you have for people to protect their content. What is What are some best practices in that area? Certainly. So let me preface it by saying this. Intellectual property, as Ram so eloquently described at the um, introduction of this show is the thing that ultimately you're incorporating into your products or services. So your brand name is the name of the thing and your content. So if you're, you know, selling a digital course or you're selling a widget that has some sort of innovation incorporated into it, those are the creations of your mind that you're looking to protect. You're protecting them really on behalf of the customer because when a customer buys your product or service, they are trusting that the brand name on that product or service, they they have an associate, so the, they're buying it because of the brand name and because they trust that brand name because they believe that the product or service will work a certain way. So think of it like, why do people pay five or six bucks for a cup of coffee from a Starbucks? Because when they see the Starbucks name or they see that mermaid logo, no matter where they are in the country, indeed, you know, in the world, if they go and they order their favorite drink, they expect it's going to be the same thing every single time. So they trust the brand because it gives them, the brand gives them confidence in what they're going to get. Because there's nothing worse than you need a cup of coffee and then you go get it and it tastes terrible and you've got to throw it out. 
So the reason it's important to protect your intellectual property is to ensure that customers can have confidence in what they're buying from you. So that helps with you know, the trademark. You don't want other people to be able to use the trademark or something similar because if a customer's confused into thinking, hey, I bought this from company A, but I thought I was buying it from company B and the consumer's confused and the company A product is terrible. It's going to hurt the reputation of company B. It's going to decrease their sales. It's going to diminish consumer confidence. And ultimately, they could go out of business. The second reason that we want to protect our intellectual property um, is to not just to ensure that we're protecting customers from, you know, brand dilution, things like that, but we want to make sure that when we improve or let's say that we have content and we want to make a promise about that particular let's say that it's course and we want to promise the customer that hey this is going to deliver a particular transformation for you if you consume it exactly in the way that we prescribe it so if we do that and the customer follows the instructions they will get the same result every single time. What happens though, if somebody comes along, takes your content or takes your innovation, they could put it under a totally different name. So it's not a trademark problem, but maybe it's a copyright or a patent problem. And what they're delivering is inferior to what you're delivering. Let's get sort of like in the scary space, this is something like in food and drugs. If you take a like, if you take a particular type of medication and it goes to generics and then the generic company wants to offer it and they're like, this is equivalent to, you know, next gum, the purple pill. The customer is going to expect that it does the same exact thing as the product that they bought under a particular branded name. If it doesn't and it causes harm, we actually not only is the customer harmed, but the original creator of that product is harmed because nobody knows what to trust anymore. So I think it's important that we think about protecting intellectual property, not only to protect ourselves, our competitive advantage and our ability to exclude other people from you know, competing with us, but also with the mind of making sure the customer can count on what they're buying and that they're going to have a consistent experience every single time. You know, I love that. And the consistency of experience is critically important. When I And when I think about this, I think in terms of certainly consistency, I'm thinking in terms of relevancy. So mm -hmm. making sure to your point about that brand's promise that you're going to actually deliver on the experience or, you know, that they, that the, that the customer is paying for, that it's you know relevant, uh, that that you know that brand, a product or service is relevant, is actually going to serve a need, and that it's authentic. And so, to your point about it's actually going, the quality is going to be there, or that experience is going to be there, and then points of differentiation. Right, so you need to protect that, the points of differentiation, why you're different, why the economic value or the, the, the price that you're charging you know, for your products and services you know, is reasonable, it's, you know, it's uh, meaningful, uh, and that it, you know, it's providing that, that the appropriate economic value to that customer. So I appreciate that. So tower number two is protecting your intellectual property. Um, let's talk about your tower number three. And, and I love this, this conversation because this really relates to your online presence. So when I think of the, you know, the castle, uh, your, your analogy here, um, tower number three is your online presence. And when I look at what's happening in industry, the fact that 80% of all business to business sales transactions are occurring in digital channels. Mm -hmm. uh, that this becomes more and more relevant and more and more critical for a business, for a business's survival, for a business's growth and managing that online presence. But there are some nuances to doing that effectively. So share with us what some of those best practices are to, in or, to ensure that you have an appropriate online presence that is truly representing yourself and your brand appropriately. 
certainly. So there's a couple of aspects to this. And I appreciate what um, the point that you made that so much of commerce is happening through digital channels, which means that the customer has to trust that the digital transaction will not compromise any of their personal information. So if they're going to give their credit card, then they want to make sure that there's not going to be a breach and somebody else is going to be able to steal it, steal their credit card number, steal their identity, steal any information. They also want to make sure that the vendor got the order and that it's going to show up on time. So when I talk about protecting your online presence, the thing that's really important is to inspire, and you'll, you'll start to notice this theme and protecting a business, the whole point of it is to protect the customer and to increase customer confidence. Because at the end of the day, isn't that the whole point of having a business? We're providing products or services to a customer. So you'll sort of see that all of this is really customer centric. It's, it's, not, it's, it's not as much about ourselves as it is about them. But if you're able to say, so for example, let's say that you have a website and you um, add a security certificate to it. So at the top of the URL, instead of HTTP, it's HTTPS and it's got this little lock on it. That tells a customer that when they visit that website, you have a layer of security in that website. So it's gonna be hard for outsiders to penetrate and come get some information from that website. So that's a form of protecting your online presence. Another way of protecting your online presence is by having a privacy policy that you actually follow. So if you have privacy policy, a privacy policy at the bottom of your website in that footer, and it says, when you give us your information, you give us your email address, or by virtue of coming here, we're going to track your activity here and we're going to use cookies or automatic data collection technologies that when we get that data from you, here's what we're going to do with it. We're going to use it to make sure that we increase or improve our customer experience, but we're not going to sell it to anybody unless our company's being acquired. So you're telling the customer, this is what we're going to do with the data. And then you're actually going to have a process in place so that you are executing on that promise. So we have making sure that we've secured our website through our web host. We want to make sure that we have a privacy policy so that um, whenever people give us their information or give us the uh, gift of their time to peruse our websites that we're showing them that we're being respectful. And it's not only to say it's sort of like, you know, the proverbial restaurant that says no shirt, no shoes, no service. You're basically saying no shirt, no shoes, no service. So if you will do those things, come on in because we want to we want to do business with you. We want to protect you. But anybody who won't agree to that, we don't want you coming in. So it sort of has this natural barrier effect. And the final thing is when you are um, asking somebody to complete a transaction, so you drop something in a shopping cart and you're actually going to provide payment information, that you are using a payment processor that others can trust. So for example, if you're like, give me this, your credit card information, you as the business are saying, listen, I'm not actually getting your credit card. Only the payment processor is getting it, and they're subject to all these financial regulations, these fi you know federal regulations, state regulations, et cetera. So I promise you, we're not getting your credit card, and because it's never coming through our servers, it's never coming through our website, but through a gateway that somebody else has, you can trust that. So I think that protecting your online presence is extremely important as a sort of like physically protecting it. The last thing I would say is it's really important that you police other people from using your domain name, your trademarks, or copying your content so that people aren't confused and they go to the wrong website. So this kind of goes back into the tower too when we think about protecting our intellectual property. So we want to say, hey, listen, if our domain name you know, is abc.com, 
we want to make sure that if somebody launches abc.biz and it's for competitive products or services, that's not cool. So we want to make sure that we are protecting our presence by ensuring other people can't steal our name. They can't be copycats and pretend they're like us, whether it's offering you know, a product or service that's competitive that incorporates some of our own technology or our own innovation, as well as mimicking us, whether it's through another website, on social media, et cetera. So there's a two part, it's like the physical security, and then there's the intellectual property protection to ensure that you're protecting your unique distinction in the marketplace. Wow. I have a follow-up question on, you mentioned the issue of privacy. So specifically, the Europeans have a much more stringent privacy mm -hmm. you know, set of laws than we do. Yes. So some people say um, uh, copyrights are really uh, relative to our own society. So we have a set and our set is less restrictive and their set is more restrictive because that's what the society wants. And other people say, no, no, more is better. Maybe the US should copy what Europeans do and have a more restrictive set of policies. So what do you think, what do you think about that? Should we, you know, just do our own thing and the Europeans do their own thing because we are different societies or should we seek to emulate their example? Well, it's a really good question. And when we think about privacy specifically, we're talking about personally identifiable information. So it has nothing to do with the product or service that's being offered, but has everything to do with the information that a customer is providing. Now, when you talk about um, the, the European rules, of course, they have nationalized, or I should say, you know, the whole European Union has, you know, created a policy, the GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, that everybody has to follow, which basically is centered on the right to be forgotten. So it's like saying, hey, listen, I'm going to come online, I'm going to do business with you. But then after that, please don't follow up with me. Please don't market to me. I don't want anything else from you. I came on, I got this. That's all I wanted. Or you know what? I'm going to come on. I want to download this free piece of content, but I don't want to hear from you every week. Like, and basically what it does is it shifts the power to the con consumer to say, I'm not interested. Now in the U S one of the reasons why we're struggling a little bit with how to handle privacy is because as a government, we're actually structured differently because we operate under federalism. So we have two layers of sort of independent sovereign entities happening at the same time. We have the states, and then we also have the federal government. So anytime the federal government, that would be our Congress, passes a law, it applies nationwide and it preempts every state's law. So it really starts to become a little bit of a different issue, not that we don't value consumer privacy and not that we don't want people to have more control over their data, but we have um, a little bit of a more complicated mess because our independent states are independently more powerful than the sovereigns are in Europe because the European Union is more of sort of a confederation. It's not a whole nother layer of government. So I think that the privacy issue is one more ultimately of politics um, than it is of interest in protecting, um, in protecting um, consumer information. The other issue that we end up having here is what information is actually protectable and what information technically isn't. What is the bargain the customer is making with the vendor? So I'm giving you this information in exchange for you sending me something in the mail. You know, I'm giving you my name, I'm giving you my mailing address, etc. So is it reasonable for the customer to say to the vendor, you don't ever get to follow up and advertise with me anymore? How much consumer control would actually so disrupt commerce that it would stop altogether. So I think there's some tug of war between um, privacy from, you know, how much is reasonable, how much is unreasonable, but also in simply managing it and making sure that we don't put ourselves in a position where every time somebody does something, especially a smaller business that doesn't have the resources of a mega company, that they're not constantly in 
violation of something that they don't understand because the next thing you know, all we would do is be in litigation all the time. So I don't think that the US can adopt something like a GDPR that applies across the board nationwide without an awful lot of agreement among the states and what they can and cannot do. I will say we do have multiple states with privacy legislation and it applies to certain people. So it's really complicated for businesses, as you suggest. Let me say this for as a practical matter, what I say to clients is this, hey, do you have a US based business or do you have a global business? Where are you marketing? Where are your consumers coming from? Wherever they're coming from, and let's look at that wide range, that universe of where they're coming from, who has the strictest regulation? Follow that. So whatever the strictest regulation is, make that be your practice for your company. So then if that regulation ultimately becomes applicable to you, then you don't have to go back and start all over again. Because what happens if you have a privacy policy that says, hey, listen, we will let's use a perfect example, like in the US right now, if you are a course creator and you say, hey, listen, download this freebie, you can go ahead and add them to your mailing list and send them information they didn't ask for without violating privacy laws. That's not the case under GDPR. So what's happening though, is because we have international commerce and we have so many you know, content creators, for example, who sell their content worldwide in 2018, it was like, oh my gosh, I have to make sure that I'm compliant with these new privacy regulations. So I have to go back to everybody on my mailing list and say, hey, can I still send this to you even though you never asked for it? So as a practical matter, I would say to small businesses, Let's just figure out what's the what is the strictest regulation that you're coming into uh, contact with and set up your email marketing software so that you are very clear with um, express consent, double opt ins, things like mm -hmm. that. And we can certainly go into privacy in more detail. Uh, but I think that um, it's going to be a while before we have um, federal privacy legislation for all of those reasons. You know, I love that. I think that's a really great tip for our audience to take away with is is look at that. You know, the, the, where you're doing business, you know, what countries you're doing business, if you're doing business outside of the U.S., and what are those strictest privacy laws, and adopt that as as your uh, as your as your current policy. That's a great way to protect yourself. Is that Absolutely. fair? Absolutely. Okay. I think so. I, I think that's that's great. And there's a lot lot to know about privacy regulations and restrictions and. You know, it's interesting as part of this conversation, thinking that just this, just what the conversation we've had so far today, you know, when I think in the terms of businesses planning for their business and putting their, you know, their business strategies in place, you know, a lot of these topics that we're touching on may or may not be included in their, you know, their current business plans. And so this is just, you know, you know, opening up, you know, generating some awareness about some of these practices um, and things to be, uh, you know, to be cautious about and making sure that you do have policies established and in place um, as opposed to not and then being and then having that exposure or having somebody breach that moat, you know, that you that you spoke to earlier. Um, you know, another point too, just to, you know, kind of bring it back to the towers, you know, when I think of a castle, I think in terms of, you know, like a visual castle, right, where you've right. got four towers, you've got your walls, you've got your moat. Um, another tower. So what's the fourth tower? So <laughs> we fourth, want to yeah, hear that. Exactly. So you know, to me, the you know the fourth tower would is uh, you know you're you're doing business. You know, you certainly have your customers, but there is an ecosystem around you, right? You're doing business with customers. You have you have strategic partners, alliance partners. You know, maintaining the relationships with with your partners um, and protecting yourself by doing so. Any any thoughts and words of wisdom uh, in dealing with some of those uh, those channel partners, if you will? Sure. So the way I kind of break it down is if we're looking at that fourth tower. So if we have our first tower, you're going to protect yourself. So you want to make sure you have an entity. You've got good insurance. Your second tower is protecting your intellectual property, making sure nobody can steal your name or, you know, the stuff that makes you unique. 
your third tower is that digital presence, making sure that nobody can come onto your digital dig, so to speak, where you've staked your ground in the, you know, in the internet, so you know, universe, so to speak. And that fourth one is really when we look at, as you were mentioning, protecting your relationships. And we have internal relationships and external relationships. So we have relationships with our team members. We also have relationships, like you say, with not just with our customers, but also with vendors and those who are, you know, our suppliers or support us from our, you know, everything from creating the product to district to uh, distributing it to products. Uh, I'm sorry, to actual customers. So this really comes down to at the end of the day, contracts, contracts, contracts. Why do we need agreements? And I think what's really important is if we think very simply that contracts are simply just memorializing an agreement between two parties. And it basically says, hey, listen, um, good fences make good neighbors. So we've agreed to do business together in some way. And we wanna make sure that we have a roadmap that documents not only what we've agreed to do to get into the relationship, but if things go poorly, or even if just circumstances change, and what we had agreed on no longer makes sense. We need to have a way to get out of that as well. And there's really three reasons that we want to have contracts. And they're called the three M's, mood, memory, and misinterpretation. So, you know, we're always in a good mood. I always say we always start in a good place, right? When we get into, um, when we get into a, um, um, a, a particular, uh, relationship. So, you know, I have a colleague, she's like, we always start in a good place, but we don't always end in a good place. So moods can change throughout the course of the relationship. And you may have interpreted something or thought something at one point, and that's sort of changing your thoughts about it or changing. The other is memory. Reasonable people can remember things differently. So if you had a conversation and let's say it was, hey, listen, we're going to enter, we're going to start this company, we're going to do this together. And if anything happens or we want to make a change, then we both need to agree that we're both going to agree to the change before we actually implement it. But if that's not written down in the actual contract and one of the parties in the relationship wants to make a change, one may think, hey, I can just make a unilateral change. I can just do this on my own because that's how they remembered it. But then somebody else may say, wait, I thought we had to agree before any changes could happen. And the other was like, well, no, no, that's not how we, what we agreed on. If it's not written down, then you have no way to resolve conflicting memories, even though they're reasonable. And the final piece is misrepresentation. People can look at documents and interpret them very differently based on how they understand certain, what they understand certain words to mean, certain phrases to mean. So it may represent one thing to one person or their lawyer and something to somebody else or their lawyer. So we wanna make sure that we document what we agreed to, the terms that we agreed to it, and also what the words of agreement mean. That's why we wanna have definitions. Um, I'll wrap this by saying I have a, a colleague and she's she's a brilliant contract lawyer and she always says this because everybody wants to focus on the, you know, if you think of a contract like a well-balanced meal, everybody wants to focus on the meat and potatoes. That's the statement of work. That's you're going to do this and I'm going to pay this. Like that's the heart of the agreement. But nobody's interested in the vegetables. But the vegetables is the procedural part of the agreement. It tells us how we get in. It tells us how we get out. It tells us, you know, are you allowed to wash the plate with, you know, in the dishwasher or you're not, you know, those types of things. So um, we want to have contracts. They don't have to be fancy. They don't have to be formatted, but we want to protect our relationships with those with whom we do business. And that's everything from terms of service on a website to an independent contractor agreement to an employment agreement. Anything that says these are the terms on which we're doing business if you document it, you're showing respect for the relationship and you're protecting yourself and them from long protracted disputes that are expensive, time consuming, and just create friction, which hurts business. You know, I, I love that. And, and, and that's such a, such a great counsel to people is to think 
about you know what the what look at the what the end could look like you know or think in terms of you know what does the end of this relationship look like and kind of back into it making sure that you're covering yourself so that you know you you have everything documented um, and you know it's like when we when we do strategic planning with many cases or when somebody's starting a new business they're they're thinking about the vision or the end in mind many many do thinking I'm going to start this business. Maybe I'm going to think five, seven, ten years out. I'm going to sell my business. You know, so there's kind of that thinking that says this is what the end could look yeah. like. I think it's a good advice to our audience here is to say you need to protect yourself. And sure, everybody's in a happy place when you embark on a relationship like this, right? Everybody's mood is festive and they're excited about the, you know what's ahead. But you know, but making sure that your processes are documented, how, you know how you're going to, you know, at what point if you're looking to end the relationship, what does that look like, and putting that down in a document like this, I think is a very, uh, it's a good caution to to to, uh, to business owners, business professionals. Well, yeah, it's always I, like if it's. I'm sorry, go ahead, Ron. I said as a follow up to that, you know, uh, we we talked about the four towers, but I would like you know, to hear our thoughts on the walls and the boat as well. So please don't forget. Yeah, that. so we've got these four towers, right? But then we want to talk about the connecting walls, right? Because it's great. We have towers, but steep people can come in. And the way I talk about the, the walls themselves are going to be your strategic allies, right? Keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer. So the question becomes, how can we work with our competitors or those who would do us harm and turn them into allies and turn them into friends. So that could be, for example, having, um, you know, a co-branded offer to say, hey, listen, you know, you offer this, uh, we offer this, that we sell them to the same customers. They're sort of similar. We might have a little bit of crossover. Why don't we just join forces and we both get paid by offering a product to the customer they're happy and we're not constantly fighting each other. So that's one way to think about it. But it's also about getting your uh, strategic advisors who are on the outside and can look and they're sort of looking at the 50,000 foot perspective at their castle and saying, listen, you've got an opening here where a competitor can come right in. How are we going to work with them and find a way to turn them into an ally. We always want to take enemies and turn them into allies. And this is one of the things that I talk to clients about when we're solving disputes. If a client is using a similar trademark, but they're not really hurting you, they're not really depriving you of any business, but you want to be careful that you don't let it get out of hand and it turns into something bigger than it is now, you can resolve that dispute by giving them permission to keep using the trademark, but limiting the products or services that they can use it on. So now you've taken someone who's an enemy and you've turned them into a friend that it has a mutually beneficial outcome, sort of that rising tide lifts all boats. So if we think about these, we've got the four towers, but we want to connect those walls with good business strategy because that's the way that we keep competitors from who you know want to come in it's expensive to constantly constantly be on the defensive mm -hmm. what if we're able to neutralize the threat by making friends and that's where an enormous amount of creative business strategy can come into play to help reduce legal costs reduce friction and increase um, goodwill consumer goodwill and competitive advantage you know I love that because in many cases by doing something just as you mentioned you're you're adding value to your customers right so you're tapping into you know to the value that they can provide and doing it in an integrated way um, and the customer benefits in the long run so I, I I love that so thank you very much for sharing that and that, you know then let's talk again at the end of the day you've got your castles you have your walls, uh, your strategic alliances, you've got your strategies in place, then you have your moat uh, that kind of keeps everybody at bay and the sentries on the tops of the towers watching uh, to see if there's any uh, you know, risk of penetration. So thoughts on the moat? Yes, yeah, so the moat is ultimately, it's that first line, right? It's basically, this is the your, your primary defense. 
And what's important is we need to render the competition irrelevant through our own innovation. If we are constantly doing more better, whatever more looks like, sometimes more may just be more value, right? But if we are innovating our products and services to consistently increase the value that we are providing to our customers at a higher rate than we're increasing their costs, it will earn customer loyalty. But that means that we're never resting on our loyals. So what our laurels. So when we have a product that we've introduced to the marketplace, it now becomes in time, it will become one of your legacy products. What's the next generation? What are we working on next? Because eventually the competition will catch up and you want to make sure that you're a step ahead. And so I think about the moat as your innovative mindset and your innovative capacity. And how are you leveraging every asset that you have in your business? It's your people, it's your ideas, it's your institutional knowledge, it's your structural systems, it's everything that you have. How are you keeping that moving? as efficiently and effectively as possible to continue innovating so that you're constantly pushing the edge, you're keeping your customer's interest, and you're always finding a need and filling it, finding a need and filling it, and you're doing it faster and better than other people. That's where a lot of businesses miss the mark. Mm -hmm. They get so excited, they get something out, but you can be rendered irrelevant overnight by somebody who comes along and disrupts a particular industry. Just think about Kodak and cameras. Right. So where's your innovation to avoid death by irrelevance? You, know, you want to make your competition irrelevant. You don't want them to make you irrelevant. You know, I, I love this too, because when I think in terms of the mode, I think about, you know, what some of the, the data points that uh, that I would look at, for example, um, with uh, for my own business or working with a client. And I think in terms of, you know, if you're paying attention to what's going on in the industry that you're serving, you know, what are those opportunities, in this case, opportunities for growth, Growth, opportunities to innovate and create new value. If you've got the towers and the walls and all that, you know, the, the, the castle itself and the keep and everything is protected, you know, and then you're innovating and, and paying attention to those, not only the internal factors, but the external forces that are facing your business to help you identify ways to create new value or ways to, to innovate so that you can maintain your relevancy, your points of differentiation, you know, con continue your revenue generating, um, you know, st business strategy. To me, putting all this together, the, the, the towers, the moats, the, the walls, and, and constantly innovating to your point so you can maintain your business model and you can grow your business, um, but you have to have an awareness of all of these things, right? Not just internal within the castle walls, but externally as well. Well, if you're spending all your time and your energy warding off enemies, you're right. not spending time and energy innovating and eventually you will die. Right. It's innovate or die. Yeah. So if I could take just a minute, let's kind of and just recap these these elements and just kind of have a key practical takeaway. Somebody's like, oh my gosh, how am I gonna do all of this if that's okay with you? Yeah, absolutely. So if we think, hey, listen, okay, my business is my castle and everything that I'm protecting, my ideas, my innovation, all of that we're going to have in the keep. So the whole point is that we've got this here and we've got to build protection around it. The first thing I want to do is save myself. I need to put on my own oxygen mask first. I want to make sure I'm operating inside a business entity. So an LLC or corporation, if you haven't started, you can always create one and dump all the stuff into it and make sure that you have good insurance because that will also help if something happens to you, you wanna make sure somebody else pays for defending the claim, not yourself. Um, the other thing that I should just mention quickly is that uh, business entities give you tax options that you don't have if you're you're operating right. just as a, as a solo um, on your own. Protecting your intellectual property, just the most, the first thing that every single business can do is when you're using your brand name, use it consistently the same way every single time. So if you want to use, for example, let's say part of your mark has first generation in it. Are you FIRST? Are you 1ST? Are you first generation? Are you first gen? What are you? Pick your mark and be consistent. Put that little TM symbol in the upper right corner 
you don't have to have anything registered to do that, but that just puts the public on notice. This is something I'm claiming trademark rights in and be consistent. That alone is step one in protecting your intellectual property. Just being consistent and telling the public, I'm claiming some proprietary interest in this and it's free. Protect your online presence. Make sure that you have a, you know, an SSL certificate. You can get it from GoDaddy, your blue, you know, from, mm -hmm. you know, your host, anybody. And make sure that you have a privacy policy if you're collecting email addresses or you're using cookies or something else. Pretty simple stuff. Um, make sure that you have agreements with everybody you do business with. Even if it's just an email exchange, it's a start. Any Reduce it to writing to avoid the three M's. Okay, very simple. Um, just an email exchange, a follow up, if nothing else, get it in writing. And then finally, um, make sure that you have an outsider who can look with neutral eyes and say, hey, listen, we've, you know, it's, it's sort of the sentries, like you say on top of the tower, it's like, right. hey, hey, we've got something coming in here so that you have somebody who's always helping you see what's on the horizon and what can you do strategically to neutralize those as turn threats into opportunities. And then once you have that and you'll have the energy to innovate and to move the ball forward, because as entrepreneurs, we really don't like all the other stuff. We just like the innovation part and that's what we want to do. So I think those are just some really good take away simple things that you can do, but if nothing else, at least shift that mindset to say, I'm building a castle and what are those things I need to do? And just that shift alone is huge for moving forward and in I, a real successful way. I, I love that. And again, it presents a real visual for people so that they, they can they can think in those terms and look at all those, you know, towers and walls and moat and, and look at what that, how to practically implement something like that you know, by using your you know strategic plan, making sure you're creating objectives and strategies for each one of these great uh, things we talked about today, so that you can make so that that's the practical advice of what we're what we're talking about today is taking that and making these recommendations and these tips actionable. You know, embed them into your business strategy, into your business plan, tie objectives and metrics around it to drive accountability. And I think you'll be in a great position. And I venture to say there are a lot of people in our audience today that have a lot of key takeaways from our discussion. So Kelly, thank you so much for sharing My that with pleasure. us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me, both of you. All oh, right. So I uh, just want to make sure uh, we do, uh, while you have, we have you here, just making sure we summarize what you said, you know, Protect your personal assets, your income, your finances, and your tax and product liability. Protect your IP to ensure you don't dilute your brand, cause customer confusion, lower sales and profits, and diminish your business value. Protect your online presence by ensuring no data breaches, privacy violations, and lost customer confidence. Protect your relationships online, offline, contracts, protracted disputes and misunderstandings. Protect your team and avoid treachery, disloyalty, and high turnover. Protect your relationships with strategic allies and block competitive threats and increase your competitive advantage. Protect the castle and build safely and support the weight of growth. And of course, when you're ready, fly a flag with confidence. So, uh, um, Kelly and Deb, thank you so much. This was such a wonderful conversation, and I, I learned so much from you today. I did too, and I love that. Fly the flag. At the end of the day, At the end fly of the it. day, fly the fly flag. Fly that flag, absolutely. Well, we need to have, we have a fly the flag, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, before we sign off, uh, how can people find you, Kelly, if they would like to connect with you? Absolutely. They can go to kellykeller.com, K-E-L-L-E-Y, K-E-L-L-E-R.com. And from there, they can learn about the various things that I do to be able to get information, uh, whether they're just looking for some, you know, uh, free information to be able to peruse on blogs, downloads, things like that, um, or learn how they could work with me if they want. But if you just go to kellykeller.com, that's K-E-L-L-E-Y, K-E-L-L-E-R, you can get all the information that you need. And also follow Kelly on LinkedIn as well. She she posts regularly and she's got some exceptional uh, blogs out there. So well done. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, let's talk a little bit about upcoming shows. All righty. So, folks, uh, on August 11th, our guest will be Hector Varese, sharing perspectives on SMPs, effective innovation strategies. On August 25th, our guest will be Sweden's own Katarina Hansen Carlson, sharing her insights on are we truly preparing our children for the future? On September the 8th, our guest will be J.D. Gerspine discussing pioneering the next frontier on LinkedIn. On September the 22nd, our guest will be George Sullivan, sharing his insights and recommendations about climate change, sustainability, why you and your business should care, and steps you can take. Folks, I want to say um, a few thank yous. Uh, specifically, you know, as tab about this, this is recorded at Butterfield Studio in Vernon Hills, Illinois, located at 1000 Butterfield Road, Suite 1007, again, in Vernon Hills. It is located just 25 minutes north of Chicago's O'Hare Airport. With its 7,500 square feet customizable staging and broadcasting space, the studio, with its full service production and broadcasting team, is sure to service your next conference, game show, product launch, brand activation, you name it. As Deb About Business, the hosts and Futures Television, thank Butterfield Studio for making the show awesome. We love you guys. Well, uh, uh, now it's time uh, to thank you guys for uh, being here with us today, with you know, Deb, Kelly and me. Remember, if you are watching the show on Futures Television as a podcast or as a recorded event in one of the social media platforms, you too can be part of the conversation. Watch for the links on this video so we can continue the conversation on our YouTube channel. I hope to see you again on August 11, when our guest will be Hector Varese, sharing his perspectives on SMBs, effective innovation strategies. Again, thank you so much, and I will leave you with our institutional message. Thank you.